Now, it turns out, and I'm not going to do that derivation for you. I'm sorry. That is traumatizing for you. I'm glad to. No one willing to admit the trauma. We can talk afterwards if you need to see it. But the mass and the radius actually don't matter. It's that fraction up front, which is the big thing. The smaller the fraction is up front, the less energy needs to go into the rolling and more energy is left over for the moving down the layer. That fraction is dependent upon how much of the mass is located towards the center. So here I got, it's rolling about, if I'm rolling about the central axis here, I've got a lot more mass towards the center than this does. All this is farther away. Between these two, they're both hoops, but pro proportionally, the distance from here to the inner radius here is divided by the total radius is smaller than this is. I have more mass here towards the center than this does. That's why I expected this one to win by a little bit. Those two look like they should be about a tie. Just curiosity. Looks like this was slightly edging it out, but potentially there is more bias again. But anyway. Is that why uh, SUVs logically deflect in a car? Ah, uh, the more likely to flip deals with center of mass that it's going to flip. There's center mass of the car. So if I've got an object here with a center of mass here, if you go right down below the center of mass, is it touching the ground or not? If the center of mass is high, Basically, it's more apt to roll. I've got a pivot point right there. If I have a torque being applied, it's going to roll. If the center mass is here, I've got, yeah, there's a torque, but the, this time the torque is acting into the ground when the ground's going to stop that. Did I answer your question? No. <laughs> you want to ask it again? No. Okay. Other questions? The less energy is needed into getting it to roll, which means more of a, more energy is left to get it to actually move down the ramp. <laughs> the greater the fraction, the more energy is needed to go into rolling kinetic, which means I have less left over to go into the linear kinetic, that the kinetic energy associated with it is actually moving down the ground. Thank you. And then vice versa. I worded it the opposite way that I worded it from an I know that doesn't mess you up. I got a certain amount of money, I, can, I have to spend it on two things. The more I spend on one, I have less for the other. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, technically, uh, if they start at rest, add those two up, it would equal the change in potential. Or, or you just go to yes. <laughs> yeah. It gets into that, you know, what shortcuts can I take that aren't going to bite me later when a student says, well, what about this case? And I have to go, okay, that accept the <laughs> A math teacher in college who would always he'd come up with some rule and then he'd go, here's a bad example, do the exception right off the bat. So he knew the exceptions were there. All right. So we have a little
little bit, hopefully a little bit better understanding of what moment of inertia is. There's some math behind it, and we get to this point where there's formulas that somebody has already come up with. If you've had calculus, uh, sorry, if you've had Calc 2, and you're interested in going through that in a little bit more detail, I'll be glad to do that individually. I will not subject the class to that. And for those of you who, to whom I'm not subjecting it, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna have to deal with that pain. All right, torque. G2 Kamukla. Newton's second law and the rotational analog. Of Newton's second law. So we start out with F equals MA. What is the rotational analog? Check your notes if you have to. times the acceleration of the object that force is acting on. The rotational analog, if I take the moment of inertia of an object, in other words, how easy is it to rotate something, times its angular acceleration, I have the torque. Uh, oh, one more thing with moment of inertia. I have two objects here that have the same mass. If anyone would like to just feel them to the, the, confirm that they have the same mass. between them is the distribution. So if you'll notice that I've got holes here, and you should be able to see the whiteboard through it, or especially if I rotate it, eventually I'll hit some angle that works for you. Well, there's a little side. I'm not quite sure where it is, but at some point you should see white on the other side. It's dark here though. So this right here has the same mass as that one, but here there's mass Put on the outsides. This one, it's the uh, the see-through part is up here and down there, and the mass is in the middle. So the mass is the same, just distribution is different. So now I have these two objects. If I want to whip them back and forth, that one relatively simple, a little bit of a whistle because of the hole. This one, it's much harder to do. Now, if possible, I could be faking it, so I'd be glad to let you experience the thrill of rotating these two things. I will. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're right. I know about some things. This might look like kids might say. So, the, this one, with the mass on the outside, has the greater moment of inertia. It's much harder to get moving, and it's much harder to, sorry, reword that. It's much harder to get rotating. It's much harder to stop rotating once you start it. This one, easy to start, easy to stop. So moment of inertia deals with how easy is it to basically, angular acceleration. I mean, the, the lower I is, the easier it is for it to accelerate. So I have this nice little formula here. However, we should be able to figure out torque some other way. Because if I said I had a force applied to the door, how would, it's not like I'm gonna measure the angular acceleration and then the moment of inertia and then go, oh, okay, here's the torque. So there's an alternate formula, or I should say, this is for the total torque. There's a formula for an individual torque. So if I got multiple forces, I can figure out the torque from each of the forces and then figure out what the acceleration should be. And we're gonna do this 
by opening and closing a door. At least it's somewhat. close this, I want to close the door. And the question is, I want to do it as efficiently as possible. How do I close it? And yes, I am taking something that you have been doing for a long, long time and analyzing it more than you ever wanted. Push on the outer part? Closer to the... That was closer to the edge? Like where the door handle was. That's why they probably put it there. That doesn't close it. <laughs> the other way? Yes. That seems to have issues. That wasn't the most efficient way I just did it. Pushing. Yes? Wait, use the words. Pushing the door closed. Pushing the door closed. <laughs> Yes, the most efficient way of doing pushing a door closed is to push the door closed. All right. What is she trying to say? She first started pushing it on the edge, or on the end, so close to the end as possible, and I did that, and it didn't seem to work. Then she said, seemed to indicate push on, you know, where the door handle is, so I pushed sort of right there, and that didn't close it. You know the words. You just never had to explain yourself before. <laughs> I once had a class try to tell me how to tie my shoes. That was interesting. Do you use the one rabbit ear method or the two rabbit ear method? <laughs> so, well, if I want to open that door, since we're on the inside now, if I want to open the door as efficiently as possible, where? How, where and how do I push? How do you describe the direction of opening for something that's rotating? Ashlyn? In which direction do you push? Inward. Inward. That's a big term. <laughs> For the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I feel like I did that. So if I have this thing open like this, mm -hmm. and I push towards the rest of it, I'm pushing like this. Mm -hmm. I push that way. Push towards you. Push, push towards me. Yes. Pushing towards me would put it like that. No, but like no. you're this <laughs> way. <laughs> what is it called? I assume you're trying to get to pushing it like this. Yes. What is that called? Perpendicular. Yes, you're pushing perpendicular to it. Oh. Yes. You got thrown by having to explain something that you know how to do. All right, you push perpendicular to the door. Now it does matter whether I push perpendicular. If you had said that to start out with, I would push that way perpendicular. So it does matter which way I push it. And most of you were in the of the idea that I should. Push it near the edge and not near the hinge. What happens if I try to open open that door by pushing near the hinge? It's a lot harder. If I push on the hinge itself, but that's gonna get me nothing. That's why they put the door handle on. Yes. That is true. That is true. Now we have three concepts here that we need to somehow put into a formula, and yes, we need to. We have how much force is applied, we have where the force is applied, and where, at what angle are you applying that force. I've got to capture those somehow in a math equation.
and it is symbolized, of course, in a shorthand notation, R cross F. The magic formula for torque. This R here has two names, of course. I, will, so I think I usually call it the Miller arm. I think Hewitt calls it the lever arm. This is the force applied. Oh, R is a vector, thus the symbol, from vector, from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. So if R is bigger, we can get a bigger torque out of it. That's why pushing farther away from the hinge works. The amount of force, yep. But we still have that angle then to deal with, and that is captured in this symbol right here. This is a cross product. We talked about dot products when we were talking about work. This is a cross product. It's the other type of multiplication. Dot products, if you will recall, if I do a dot product, I get a scalar as an answer. Work is a scalar. Here, I'm doing a cross product. I get a vector. And for the purists, it's an axial vector or a pseudo vector. But as far as we're concerned, vector is good enough. So, how do you do a dot product? Uh, cross product? Yes, Genesis. Oh, what's the word after from? Vector from. Axis of rotation to where the force is applied. The big thing with a cross product is you're multiplying the perpendicular parts. So if I've got a door here with, let's say that it has a length of two meters, and a really wide door and I apply a force of three newtons right there, perpendicular to the door. The radial vector is a vector from my axis right here to where the force is applied, that's R. This is F. Because they're perpendicular, all I do is just multiply two times three. That's the math problem. If it's perpendicular, it's simple, two times three. So I get six newton meters But I'm missing something. So I'll give people a chance to catch up or ask questions before we get into the direction of the torque. I do want to point out that when we're talking about work and energy, when I do newtons times meters, that's a joule. When we're talking about torque, newton times meters is a newton meter. It is not a joule. Joule, even, it's just the way it ends up. A newton meter is equal to a joule only when dealing with work and energy, not when dealing with torque. So six newton meters. All right, direction. Before we get into the direction specifically of torque, let's talk about the direction of that. What is the direction of that spinning? Clockwise. Clockwise. Well, it's counterclockwise spinning. Clockwise. Yeah, you're right. Wait, I don't know. To you. Yeah, to me. So, if we're using clockwise, counterclockwise, which is very convenient most of the time, and especially if you're talking about something on a wall, uh, that seems to go fine. But if you're dealing with something just spinning right there, wow, the words you have to use. Well, if you're in the classroom, in the middle of the room, looking towards the front of the classroom, towards the boards, towards the front two boards, because there's a sideboard over there, uh, it's spinning clockwise. That's just way too much. Because remember, physicists and mathematicians don't like writing. So it would be as efficient as possible. Anyone else have another suggestion for how to describe the way it's spinning without using clockwise or counterclockwise? Uh, 
positive. Uh, we do need to be more specific than that. Although, yes, you could get away with that in certain circumstances. There's some groups there. There is another suggestion that usually comes up, like left or right. But I hope you see the issue with saying it's spinning left or spinning right because it really depends on which part of the wheel you're looking at. So is there another suggestion? Oh. All right. Here's what they came up with. It is a mathematical convenience. It's just the convention. It is known as the right-hand rule. There are several right-hand rules. It's known as a right-hand rule. It, for those people who are left-handed, it is not the dominant hand rule. It is the right-hand rule. Probably the biggest mistake I see the students make is the left-handed people who constantly want to use their left hand to do it. And then they get to a point, some will get to a point where they're going, I'll use my left hand and just write down the opposite of what I've got. Which works fine until you start to get an intuitive sense and then you start sort of double guessing so, right hand rule. So what they did, we have an axle here. It's spinning about some axis of rotation. That axis of rotation is going basically back of the room, front of the room. So when you do this, you got a hand, your right hand, your thumb is gonna be the axle, which means my thumb is pointing to the back of the room or pointing to the front of the room. Now my fingers obviously naturally curl in some particular direction. I'm talking for most people, if you have some freakish hands and your hands can bend backwards, that this is just a way of thinking about it, like what most people would do. Their hands bend one way or the other. So as this spins, well, if my thumb is pointing that way, my fingers will curl opposite the direction of the rotation. So my thumb has to point this way, my fingers now curl in the direction of the spin, and so the angular velocity is to the front of the room. We are not claiming that there's anything physically actually going to the front of the room. This is just the convention of saying, how is it spinning? Well, it's spinning with a velocity, angular velocity to the front of the room. And it doesn't matter where you are, it's gonna be spinning this way for anybody in the room or outside.